Hello and welcome to another exciting edition of the Glaswegian Geeks. I am your part host, James. Today joined by... Part host, Mario. And together we make one big juicy host. A roasting host. Aye, we're like, we're like Fry and Laurie. But oh. like... You're like Steve Rick and Morty. Aye, aye. And like, you're Morty and Stephen Fry and I'm Hugh Laurie and Rick. Uh, how, how'd you get the cool ones? Well, you don't drink. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you that. So, there you go. <laughs> that's yes. that resolved. I'm the leading man. You're the intelligent, well-read thing on the side. Thing? Man on the side. Man ah, of action. Okay, man of okay, action. I'll go with that. Uh, yes, what are we here for, James? Um, comic of the month. Another wee comic of the month. Uh-huh. That month flew in right there. Yes, we are here for a little comic of the month, and this is covering June. A lot of good things came out, and I was really at a loss of what to pick, James. I'm actually surprised with the the improved level of greatness with the, the most recent run of comics. Yeah. Because it does, it gets so difficult, and I think we end up picking the, the most common ones because well they are so good like yeah, and they like continue really they're good they're stories. consistently good like take a look at secret war uh secret empire sorry uh you have nick nick spencer and uh, nick spencer writing up a hell of a story over there which we're now finally getting a lot of tie-ins to that arc so it's very well insightful and it yeah, fills in a lot of the like, fills in a lot of the gaps that I've mentioned previously, and then take a look at uh, what's happening over at DC. Tom King is absolutely ripping it up. Like he's Batman, he is. Uh, oh, like this, I, I've always said like Grant Morrison running Batman is my favorite, but this really, this really is really is, is really close. Like I, I want to see Big Grant and. Big Tom get together, that would be a fucking mad story. I wouldn't be like. surprised if they've actually maybe done a wee bit of Batman brainstorming, what's not been done. Well, it's... Because if you look at Grant Morrison done a lot of crazy things with Batman, rightfully so, Batman is mental. Well, Zoran or Ra. Yes. Like, let's, yeah. let's not forget the, the big campy yes. mindfuck that was Batman Zoran or Ra. I think that's how you say it. Zoran R. If we say it fast enough, there we go. That. There we go. Zorana. <laughs> yeah. So. So what's your Tom, comic of the month? Well, as I just said, Tom King is absolutely killing it over at DC, and uh, it really, it, it it was a absolute pick. Like it was Secret Empire or this, and this just edged out, and it is Batman issue twenty five, which is. Part one for the War of Jokes and Riddles, something that was teased a few months, uh, like two months ago, with yeah, uh, yeah. the Bane story arc, just as a throwaway line from the Riddler, and you're like, hmm, War of Jokes and Riddles, what could that be? Yep, I've chose Batman issue 25, which is part one of the War of Jokes and Riddles out of eight parts. Uh, as usual, we have Tom King writing this masterpiece. We've got Mikael Janin. Janin? I, I wish I told you how to say Mikhail it. Mikael Janin. Mikael Janin. There we go. Uh, doing pencils, inks, and the cover. And then we have Jun Chung doing colours. And well, let me tell you, like, from what I read from that book, it, it shaped up to be a big one. Like, like the... W- there's something I want to get into right away, and it's the look of the Joker. This is very reminiscent of your uh, killing your joke. Y- Joker? Your, your killing joke, Aye. like bef- like the suit and the hair, really reminds me of killing joke. The flashbacks of how he before he went and fell in the chemicals. Yeah, the and black stuff. suit, the purple waistcoat. Like the th- I don't know if it's maybe following on from the events of that. We'll probably know more uh, as the issues go in, because uh, it's an eight-part beast in Batman. That's that's something epic right there. Well, see, this is the thing that quite interests me, because the Riddler and the Joker are like my two main squeezies of the Batman universe, the Scarecrow as well. But uh, Riddler is a character who we're always used to seeing as being a bit of a 
for want of a better word, a shite bag, and of course. usually hides behind the scenes. But in this book, you see him get right in the faces of people bad and good. You know, he's in there, and whenever Riddler's sort of giving you his intense inner monologues, he's telling you how he solves riddles, like how he solved a particular riddle, and how he does it, and how quickly he does it. Like, he, he, I mean, he, he deduces it in, like, a page, basically, which to his equivalent is probably, what, 20 seconds? If that. So, uh, for what I've seen, it's, uh, we're seeing these two power-headed characters. Let's just clash. say it, they're juggernauts in the Batman universe. They're two of the top villains for Batman. In well, Riddler, when he's done well, right, is definitely up there. Oh, yeah. But when Riddler's not done right... I well, you can say the same about any character. When they're done right, they're... they're like they're like the main villain, but if you think of main villains for Batman, I would say both of them are in the top five. Obviously, Joker being number one for obvious reasons. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, yeah, in this we're seeing a Riddler who breaks out of Arkham and then just gets past security guards just by rhyming off their family names uh, of their family name, members, names of their the family the members, daughters, and, it's the, the and like that's all. That's all he needs. Just, yeah, there was one line in particular uh, from the Riddler uh, as he's walking out. When is it bad luck to see a black cat when you're a mouse? Like, he, he, well, ag- he against all those security guards as a mouse, and he's just like, oh, well, I've got this over you, so fuck yous. Well, see, this is the thing. It's, uh, it's very much like... It, I think that line sums up the whole scene. You know, at first you would say he's the mouse, and He's up against all these black cats, but then he's got info on them, and he's became the black cat. He's reduced them to the size of mice because he's got that on them, and he doesn't need to threaten. He doesn't need to do anything. He just no, has to say no, them. Then that's, that's all. That's the power of the spoken word, and that is terrifying. Someone, especially like Riddler, who clearly has some issues where he likes to hear himself talk. Oh yeah, absolutely. We all know that Riddler loves a wee, a wee, a wee playback. He's in voice, but like us when we listen to the podcasts back. What I I don't listen. Yeah, you edit them. Yeah, well, that, I don't it take. Great you happily edit them, so you know. You uh, moral of the story. I don't know about happy. <laughs> the fuck. Uh, yeah, there's a there's a couple of wee things here. That it's mainly f- uh, the st- the story of this book basically follows a Riddler and Joker. Mainly the Riddler, uh, as him breaking out, uh, slicing a security guard, a uh, policeman's throat, then stabbing him 26 times each time for a letter of the alphabet, and just typical Riddler stuff, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the reason being that he breaks out and stuff is because the police have went to Riddler before to try and help solve crimes, and this one's clearly a Joker one. So... He solved it, but guess who hasn't? Batman. He's just ahead of the curve with Batman. He's two feet in front, and you know we've got a f- absolutely lovely double splash page of the Joker and the Riddler, and a big glass open office sort of, and it's very it it show you see, you see the bat signal you see Gotham you know it's 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 a stunning looking page yeah, and you've got a lot a lot of dialogue from the Riddler like this guy cannot shut the fuck up I'm actually on side with the Joker in this like this guy can't shut the fuck up but a bullet can make him shut the fuck up we've well, spoken awful lot about the Riddler I think we should some bring yes, people up yes, to speed yes, where yes, the Joker yes. is in this so the Joker is uh, having a bit of a uh, he's crisis having a ba- he's having a bad day he's ha- no I think he's having a bad month <laughs> I think no, a I think bad month's a bit much or I think he's not in a good place and I mean we see the Joker systematically killing people in yeah. typical Joker fashion for what reason because he can't th- laugh he can't laugh well nothing's making him laugh the chase of him and Batman doesn't make him laugh the the general killing of people yeah, doesn't yeah. make him laugh. Nothing Just usually. like walking down the street, next to a police car, like, bang, shits a woman. Yeah, nothing. Like, no. like... He's depressed. Like, usually, usually you would see Joker do some kind of wacky, like, plot to, like, blow up the city or something, but he's just like, wonder if this will work. He's, he's, he's just walking around, bang, 
No, no, even that. I yeah. th- I think this boy is clinically depressed. I I think he's clinically depressed, and maybe that's <laughs> the best thing really yeah. for him. But I no think we've diagnosed it after I all these years. He's he's miserable because from what we're garnering and from what Riddler's figured out, he's just nothing. Nothing's giving him that that drive anymore. And I think that might explain why he's wearing the black suit and stuff like that. He's no wearing these colourful attire. He's no doing it like that. He's he's pretty. He's dressed in black. He's got a wee bit of purple. Yeah, for the gloves, you know. For the gloves. But but this yeah. is a thing. This is what I'm excited about in the next uh, few issues, and obviously the whole arc of this. What Joker is this? Like, I, that's two questions. Is this the Joker that's just after fe- f- uh, falling in the chemicals, or is this just maybe a couple years down the line, Joker? Second question: Which Joker? Because we know that there are three Jokers now. So which one's this? Is this the Alan Moore one? Because it's not the classic kind of Caesar Romero s- over the top style comedy slapstick humor killing, and it's not uh, the end of uh, end of days. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's not the end of days. Uh, New Fifty Two, which we will get onto later. Part of me think, oh, but part of me does think though, is it him? Is they wear the sim- like the, the the sort of end. Basically yeah, the black suits, yeah. Well. The black suit, the hair, but he's happy. So it's like, we don't know why. We'll get obviously onto this with the forge, but yes, um, yes. I think it could be. I think the forge obviously happens after, and that's the Joker we see in that is the fate of the Joker after this. Uh, because So basically where this goes is Riddles came to the Joker with an idea. He's like, if you kill, if you try to kill Batman before I kill him, I'll kill you. And you and the Riddler says, but if I try to kill Batman before you and steal your punchline, you'll kill me. The only way we can get out of this hell of needing to beat the Batman is if we work together and we do it together. And Joker's like, mm, you're right. You know, you're right. That's it. Nothing's going to make me laugh unless this happens. And then he's like, well, maybe this will. <laughs> and he just pulls his gun out and shoots Riddler. And honestly, Why? Because he's a joker and he can do anything. But he doesn't like being told. He doesn't like being told what he needs to do. Like, that's that's something that shows you... It's not the joker sitting there going, oh, we need to do this. You're right. You're absolutely right. We need to work together. I think this is a very much a joker who... Is still trying to maybe figure out what the deal is with him. And I loved that. I love when he just shoots Riddler in absolute cold blood, like point blank, right through his stomach. Because he doesn't care. He's at the point of where he's just like, nothing's working for me. I've tried killing all these people. I've tried getting comedians to make me laugh. And tell them a joke about Scotland. Pricks. Fuck you, Tom King. Just joking. Well, we complimented him. Yes, like yes, <laughs> yes. And we still do. But uh, uh, but that's that's the thing. The Joker's trying everything and he's just went, mm, maybe maybe it's this way where uh, the Riddler's said about, oh, if we go to war each other, we're both going to die and who's going to win Batman? Maybe he's like, hmm, a war against you might actually be fun. Hmm? It might, that might be why he started, why he shot him in the first place. And as we know, from the title, the War of Jokes and Riddles started a war with the Riddler for reasons unknown yet, but I'm saying he's just depressed and he needs a wee hug. Does need a wee hug, I must admit, but uh, Batman is not in the nature of giving hugs. So, yeah. The War of Jokes and Riddles, to me, is definitely one to watch. I think there's going to be a lot of good shit coming from that. And what happens at the end? Well, that's the thing. Batman is lying in well, Bruce is lying in bed with Selina Kyle, and that's the thing. It says to her, "Where does it? Where does it? Where does it? What I had to do? Yeah, what I had to do, which makes me think, if it's three Jokers, what has he done? Because we all know that Riddler knows what has happened, but now we are going to find out. 
Well, this is the thing. Bruce obviously feels very guilty about it. And Riddler says, well, I still haven't forgotten the war of jokes and riddles. So it's very much like, hmm. It's a major, major issue. There is a major issue, but Riddler certainly didn't get the worst of it. Nope. I don't he got the better deal, I think. Yeah, he's still not happy about it, but he got the better deal, I think. Yeah. <laughs> so what would you rate it then, Maru? Mm. Because it, like, there is a lot of action in it and a hell of a lot of dialogue. Uh, not much. As much that, that there has happened, not a lot's happened. And with the prospect of the beautiful face-to-face image that we had of Joker Riddler with every other villain, every other Batman villain in the background fighting each other, uh, I would have to give it a 9 out of 10. It's, it's, it's straight from the first issue and the tease that we had from the Bane story arc, I Am Bane. Uh, this has been built up for a couple of months, so it's not overly built up like the button has been, you know? Yeah, it was just subtly mentioned, and I mean, on that note, I'd give it, I'd give it an eight, just because this is a novella. This is like a little noir piece. This is just to sum it up that these two characters, who are equally as evil as each other and can be, are gone toe to toe with each other, and the Joker fucking started it. So I think, truthfully, it's going to build up to be a a big cacophony of despair and pain and like I say you, you're wanting to know what Bruce did yeah. you want to know what Batman did so that's keeping you gripped and hopefully we find out a little bit more of that and I actually think the War of Jokes and Riddles is going to go on a lot longer as what it is I don't think a lot is going to be left to the very very oh, end oh it won't be if you think about it we know that uh, Joker's still alive we know that Riddler's still alive so is it going to be something like uh, issue eight hits and then maybe six, seven issues down the line we're going to see a little current day face-off between them and they'll be like, remember that time that we went to war with each other? <laughs> Let's uh, do it again! <laughs> <laughs> Let's join up because, you know, Riddler, you were right. James, mm-hmm. what's your pick been? Well, I must admit it's uh, it's been tough, but it's another DC entry. Ooh. It is... The Dark Days of the Forge, DC's sort of introduction to the dark multiverse. Yes, the prelude to DC Meta. Because you can't whenever, kill them. whenever you say that, you have to throw up some devil horns. And fuck you, Gene Simmons, for trying to patent that, you cock. Well, well I must admit, the intro to... So I've chosen Dark Days of the Forge... Okay, Which, uh, and the reason why is because it's uh, it, it, I'm considering that a big event. <laughs> so it, it's shit's gone down, and no one quite knows what's going on. And right off the bat, you're getting this idea that Hawkman and Hawk Girl are involved somehow. Something is involving them, particularly with a specific scene with Bruce Wayne who wakes up in bed, funnily enough, next to Selena Kyle. Oh dear. Which is telling me, which is me thinking that this is at the same time he's telling the story of the war of jokes and riddles. No, well, he's not exactly going to stop in the middle of war no, jokes no, no, and riddles he's and no, go, <laughs> Selena, dear, hold on, I'm going to tell you. Shit's gone down. <laughs> Shit's gone down. I'm going to come back in maybe like half a day, right? Just half a day. I'm going to tell you the rest of the story later. He's not going to leave her on a cliffhanger. He's going to finish telling all that tale. Because he likes to... Well, he's engaged there now, so he's kind of like having to like just be beat up. <laughs> well, I suppose... You well, know, well, like, she she'll be like, Bruce, go out. I've already signed the will. Don't worry. You die. die. You die. I get the bat cave. It'll be called the cat the cat cave. The cat cave. But yes, uh, Dark Days of the Forge is very interesting. I think it takes place... I'm going to give it placement round about the same time that Batman is telling the story of the War of Jokes and Riddles. And there's a particular scene where Bruce Wayne sort of wakes up in the middle of the night and we just see in the background Hawk Girl's mace hung up on a wall. You know, to show that is to imply that that's going to be relevant. You know, it's not just a collector's piece that Bruce has. It, to me, it's a it's an important piece of juxtaposition. Right, 
and uh, that's why I think this is going. The intro is well being very sort of hot man, hot girl. You know the very Thor style of artwork and uh, the the way things are written and the way that the panels eventually work. So that's definitely very very interesting to me. Another thing about it that I really really like is the inclusion of so many characters. Because normally I don't like too many characters. Well, this is the thing. The Dark Days of the Forge is pretty much a prelude to DC's Metal. This is exploring the dark multiverse. So this isn't just like a Batman story or a Hawkman, Hawk Girl story. This is going to be a universal-wide event. So if everyone that's like on Earth, because they're, they're making subtle hints at something is wrong with the core of the Earth. And maybe so, some something's yeah co- something's, something's caused it. So it's it's involving a lot of characters because I think from metal you'll probably have a lot of tie-ins. So it's a nice way to kind of start the arc and go. Well, if you want to know what so and so is doing in this arc, then read their title because. We've already established that they're yeah. tied into this. Well, I mean, I must admit, can we have props for fucking Aquadad there? Like, with his beard. And they're trying to go with this Jason Momoa look, but not with the... Oh, well, the, the blonde. The blonde. The blonde Aquadad. Well, to be honest, that's the kind of old-style Aquaman. The, I think, if I remember right, is around the time of Grant Morrison's run on it. But then again, I think he had one arm then as well. Yeah, but, yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's... It's a, it's a, it, it's a throwback style to classic stuff, which I th- I've not read any of uh, Aquaman yet I've, uh, from Rebirth. I have recently picked up the issue 25 due to the artist, but uh, I've not read it yet. So it'll be nice to see if from Rebirth they actually went with the classic look or this is just a, okay, change the tone of the title, give them a new look and stuff, refresh them a little. Yeah, well, we have the inclusion of the Green Lantern as well, sent by Gunthet. Yeah. On a secret mission to Earth, and none of the fellow Green Lanterns are to know about it, and neither are any of the Justice League. That is what he's specifically told. So, we really see him going to Earth, but we don't know why he's there. He's just told there's a threat coming, effectively. And when he gets there, who does he get a, into a confrontation with? The new Robin. Well, I, I don't think they name him. I think Green Lantern actually has a joke saying, what are you, like, Canary, Robin? You know, the, there's a couple of throwaway lines and stuff, so... Yeah, well, this guy is, he's, I mean, yellow suit, black bat signal. He's effectively... I mean, he's a bat child. Is he a bat child? Is he is he part of Batman Incorporated? He's, is he's, that still he's a part thing? of. Uh, remember when Joker was it or was it Bloom? I think it was Bloom in New Fifty Two infected lots of people. No, no, no. Sorry, it was Joker with a laughing gas. His mother uh, was infected with laughing gas, and well, he's it's actually uh, referred in this issue that uh, his mother is infected still. With the Jokerized gas. Oh dear. Well, his name is Duke Thomas, yes. and he doesn't have a code name yet, according oh. to Duke Thomas. And uh, usually, you would think Batman would be quite quick to give somebody a code name, but you know, maybe he's letting him earn his title. You know, mm. I know there's a couple ones where it's just, oh, instantly you're Robin, but maybe it's a it's a new day, so let them earn their title and come up with it themselves. Yeah. So you know, you've obviously got the panels where we see. You know, Duke's mum. Yes. Jokerized, and you know the line basically is: "Is she was once before the Joker talks and ripped her mind apart before her son Duke had to move her into Wayne Manor." It's a uh, they're trying to cure her, which is a noble cause. But I think her. the way this is going is it's not working. Yeah, if she's if quite if it's taken part. so long to like mention this and bring it up it's not going to happen for a while yeah and to be honest I can't see her being cured because she looks like she is part and part Joker oh, oh, in this book she's, she is. I think she's gone she's gone, she's fucked but yeah again obviously we see Bruce with Selina in bed and then we just see that kind of off shot of the mace 
which tells me that Hot Girl or Hot Man is directly involved. And you, part of me does think that their inclusion, because I've not actually seen them for a while. Uh, so this is obviously going to bring in more characters who we've maybe not seen in a wee while and put them to the test. Batman ends up finding, you know, this kind of... What is it? Is it like a, a, a ship? Is it like a castle at the end of it? It's a bit strange. It's like a big gold... I think, from the look of it, I want a... I'm I'm going to just throw it out there. I think it looks like something from Apocalypse. If you think of that kind of technology and stuff, like Aspire from the kind of New 52. Remember when Justice League uh, formed in the New 52? It was actually because of Apocalypse and these spires were... Yeah, well, I mean, he finds it in the Fortress of Solitude. I th- well, that's the thing. He's got Mr... Miracle, is that the guy? Yeah, that's a Miracle. Yeah. Who kind of says to him, don't go near it. Yeah, Stay like away from this, it. This is the thing, like, he's he's l- left something in the Fortress of Solitude, which is like a break glass in case of absolute fucking dire emergency, because Superman's not even, like, able to see it because it's lead-lined, and there's no, like, key, so he's got Mr. Miracle there to break open this. Uh, which... We'll find out down the line, I'm guessing, uh, what it is. And also, at the same time, you've got Hal Jordan and Duke Thomas going through this kind of hologram wall in the in Bruce Wayne's Batcave on Earth. And they're following this voice, and this voice actually knows quite a lot and knows some kind of dark, dark secret. And letting them on and leading them to this. And at one point, Hal Jordan tries to uh, use his ring, and it doesn't work. For some reason, it doesn't work. But this voice knows who it is, why it's not working, which is absolutely terrifying. That some that someone knows more about what's happening than our heroes. And who is that person? James, take away. It is the one and only... Total cock that is the Joker. Somehow he's being kept prisoner by Batman. Yeah. Is it why? Is it for means of the Joker is a benefit, or is it to keep him imprisoned away? And this is what leads me to believe that he is the Joker from the War of Jokes and Riddles because he's wearing the same suit, he has a similar hairstyle. The only difference is he's laughing again. And it's very, d- it, it just seems the placement. Let's reveal the war of jokes and riddles. Let's reveal the dark multiverse now. Let's do that. And it just seems to tie in quite nicely to, oh, well, this Joker. And then Bruce is saying, I had to do something really, really bad. And now we're at a stage where we see this Joker, who I'm convinced is the same Joker. He's not wearing the purple gloves, though. He's not, but he's wearing the black suit. And if I he's know. The purple waistcoat, he but is that Joker. But this is very endgame Joker. No, well, that's the thing. The, the hairstyle's very end game, and it, end game for to believe in only happened a few days before, because you know that's how comics work, James. Yes, yes, you, you can go through a million of these fucking tragedies <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just be fine with it's it. It's just an every other I Wednesday. Mean, I mean, Bruce had a big fight with Ben, and he was up on his feet in like a week. I <laughs> know. So yes. maybe all right. We'll say in end of days was a month. Before. Ah, okay. We'll say that. But the Joker knows something. And his last line that ends the book is, "You're just another couple of pieces. Pe- you're just another couple of pieces in Batman's puzzle, just like me." <laughs> it's nice to see him laugh again. I must admit. Well, that's the thing. I think I would say that he's more terrifying laughing than not. He's Be- like, he especially because he knows more than he's letting on, obviously. You know, but he's writing a lot of numbers. Well, here's the thing. Does he? Is he? Does he know more than oh. he's done? Oh, is it the anti-life equation? <laughs> Finally, mm. after all this time, we're going to know the anti-life equation. No, I don't. No, I don't. I, I, don't, I don't think it's that far ahead. But uh, I certainly think that uh, you know, it's Im- it's heavily implied the Joker knows a lot more than he's let on in this book. And part of me does think it's it is Endgame Joker or Joker from the War of Jokes and Riddles. 
Well, if it's in-game Joker, then it would explain where he's been, because the last time we did see him was, if I remember right, it was at the end of... In a of cave, when, you know, him and Batman yeah, were left like to die in a cave. Yeah, yeah. And then Batman comes back with no memory of who he is, and then fucking boom, that's it, he's Batman again yeah. after that. Because then we were introduced to the beauty that was Commissioner Gordon, Batman. <laughs> no, in fact, the last time we seen him was he was sitting in a park in a white suit, mo- emotionless. Remember? I think it was uh, one of the last issues of Snyder's Very Batman. Very Returns. Yeah, yeah. So we have seen him up to a certain point, but how the fuck has Batman got him in the cave and why? And has he been seeking his help for stuff? Because, you know... Is he there by maybe choice? Maybe he's... Is he there by choice? That's actually a good question. That's also, is Batman trying to think of something to stop a, another disaster, but in doing so, he's having to seek help from the most unlikely person and possible? And what is young Duke Thomas going to do? Now that he's confronted basically with his mum's killer. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Green Lantern is on his Todd. So, it's definitely one I want to keep reading. I want to keep getting into it and seeing where that goes. So... It's going to be definitely very interesting. <laughs> what Joker is it? Who fucking knows? <laughs> you can only guess. But I think that's the most for it. I mean, it's written by Scott Snyder, so Scott Snyder and James Tennyson? 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 The thing? Yeah. It sounds like a disease, really. Uh, Penciled by Jim Lee, Andy C- Cuba, John Romita. John Romita Jr.? John Mayer Jr. and you know obviously inked by Scott Williams, Klaus Janssen and Danny Mickey. So a lot of talent. So it has to go somewhere. Yeah. Uh, well that's the thing. This is a prelude to DC's metal event which uh, the cover was released for this week which is very metal. The Justice League in a or instead of like in a like kind of huddled group pose they're in a formation that resembles some devil horns. I'm all about that. All is about that. All you need is Jack Black on top of it, going, you can't kill the metal. <laughs> like, that's literally all that's missing from that image. And Pretty by much. God, let's just see where it goes. Because <laughs> it looks fucking mental. Well, that's the thing. We will find out eventually in metal what is happening. But, James, can I ask you a question? You can. What do you rate it? I've got a level where you right. I've got to get a six. Ooh. Got to get a six. It's, it's very average. I like Ouch. it, but I think it's quite average. But from what, from when I read it, what I read, and what I'm seeing, is it's obviously leading up to a big event. We can't deny that. But unlike the War of Jokes and Riddles, the War of Jokes and Riddles gave you everything you needed. Why these two are going to be fighting each other, why they hate each other, what's causing it. You get a bit about what's happening and why the Riddler's doing what he's doing and why the Joker's doing what he's doing. This seems very, oh, look at all this stuff that's happening. Well, It feels like there's a lot thrown in, and for good reason, probably. Well, this it, it just doesn't seem cohesive enough. I mean, I was loving when you see the Joker at the end, because it it was so unexpected, which is like, fuck, no, I need to read the next one, because it's like, what the fuck is he doing there? Like, and why is he being so chill about it? He's obviously there by his own admission. He's accepted something, like, that he would never normally accept. Why? So, obviously, I think the next issue is going to be really, really good, not just because the Joker's in it, but because he knows something, and he now has became tied to the plot from the start. So, wh- wh- where are we getting? What are we getting? You know what I mean? And I just feel this issue doesn't give you the impact that you're supposed to get from, like, a, s- a book that introduces a bigger story. You know, that's that's just what I'm thinking. So, I think it's very average. I don't think it's revolutionary, in my opinion. I, I wouldn't say it needs to be revolutionary. It's, it is a prelude to DC's next big event. So, this ha- this is basically a teaser. Whereas part one of Jokes and Riddles is part one of that arc, so it kind of needs to give you a lot of stuff to hook in. This, they're just teasing you with, with the characters that will be involved, the 
the dark multiverse, the nth metal, uh, Superman's Fortress of Solitude's got this big spire in the back of it that Batman has to keep there and have a lead-lined wall so that Superman couldn't see in. And it's behind a door that's not open by any conventional key that he needs Mr. Miracle to break open. There's a lot of, like, this is my nuclear weapon. Like, I'm being resorted to go into this and taking these measures where, like, clearly Mr. Miracle, once he see- sees what it is, he's like, no, nope, you're on your own. I'm like, fucking oh, off. I, I'm, I'm, I'm out of here, pal. Like, nice knowing you. Do whatever you want with that, but I'm out. Like, that's, that, that, that is what I get from that. He's just like, just nope, that's that's too out my scope for me. Yeah, that's what I like about how people reacting to Batman in such a negative way and what ah, he's doing. Because he, he was a dick, to be honest. He, he was the one that created files on every member of Justice League in the eventuality to take them down, which, you know, is a good cause because... How many times have we seen like super bad Gre- the evil Green Lantern possessed by Parallax and stuff retconned, uh, Wonder Woman stuff like like how many times have we seen those characters? Like, the idea is, is Batman's really the only human one. Uh, oh, not, he's not got nothing. He's he's nothing. He's he's nothing, he's without, nothing without. Oh, he's a, he's a master of whatever, however martial many art. martial arts and stuff. But realistically, he's only human, so he needs all this arsenal and. Secret weapons, stashes, and stuff, and but why? That's the. Big he's question. overcompensating. He's got a teeny cock. <laughs> he's landed Selena Kyle, mate. I don't think he's got a teeny cock. She's seen some action. I don't know. Maybe he just lets her tie him up. You know. Well, I'm, I'm telling you, mate. I'm telling you, mate. I've been in a night out with Selena. She's all right. Like she's she knows her game. You know, she went out. I mean, I went to a nightclub where once she started doing some cat dancing, some lap dancing, some whip show. It was great. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm talking about the Catwoman movie. Let's wreck on that. <laughs> Doesn't exist. But the fact of the matter is, is it's like Bruce is planning for something big, and I like that. I like this inclusion of the Joker. I love it. I love it. I love it. I want it. But the book, to me, just as a prelude, it, it wouldn't grip me if it didn't have the those two things: Batman being an ass and the Joker being there but being quite happy about being there do you know what i mean i don't think he's so much as happy as like hey hey, i've got guests finally (laughs) great that's what i'm like i think i I just overall i think it's just a very average story i'm not saying it's bad but i'm not saying it's great either i'm saying but i think what's to come will be great because dc aren't letting you down with the stories right now ever since rebirth they've really kind of got their act together so we can only wait and see Yep. Uh, I would have to go with this. I know you gave it a six. And there's a lot of stuff there to hook you. And I do love uh, Scott Snyder's run on Batman. I feel that was very refreshing for the character. You had the Court of Owls. You had uh, the Joker with the face off and stuff. Death of the Family. Yeah, he gave us Gordon Batman, you know. There, there's gave a, us a lot of good. There's a lot of good, and I can't see any bad. Like, usually you look at a Batman arc and you're like, ah, this, 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 and that. But Snyder's arc, it was a nice. It, it did take me a while to get into it, but he's. Once, once the action starts, it doesn't stop. Yeah. It, like, it just goes. And he writes the Joker as a horror character. He writes. That's why, like, obviously, I'd think that is end game Joker at the end because it's Snyder. But it's like, what has happened? Where are we going with this? And what's next? But that's just that's just my view. I, I have complete faith in Scott Snyder. I just want a wee bit more in the next yeah. issue. Cool. I would. Uh, I don't actually think I rated it there. I would have to go with an eight out of ten for that. The artwork is absolutely beautiful. Uh, John Romita Jr. always loves his work. This is the thing. Like some people will be like, oh don't like this artist's work and whatever. See if I can look at a piece of someone's art, whether it be Alex Ross or John Romita Jr. or Frank Cho. I <laughs> you thought you were going to say a piece of somebody's ass there. I was like, Mario! Well, I can always tell somebody's <laughs> ass. <laughs> for fuck's sake. I just thought that was what you were, you were about to say by accident. And I was like, oh, he fucked it. I will <laughs> insert in this point right here, WWE's badass belly gun ass man. Oh, insert. <laughs> well, that's actually one of the lines in the song. But, uh, yeah, if I can notice someone's art, art, Jim's art. art, then I consider it good. 
because it's stuck with me, it resonated with me, it's ingrained in my brain that that's our style. If I look at, a, at someone's artwork and I'm like, uh, I don't really know who that is, but it's kind of good, then I don't, I'm not saying it's bad, but I'm kind of, in the way that I'm going with this, it's not bad, it's no better than fucking anything I could ever do, but uh, it, if I recognise something right away, then I'm like, good artist. Absolutely. You see it in many things, like, you know, you see it in, you know, Adam Miller's Killing Joke, you see it in, like, Alias, different art styles that really benefit. And onto something that I think is pretty good art, your graphic novel of the month. Yes, 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 it's my time. Yeah, and for those that don't know. It's simply your cycle right now. Yes, yes, it's my time of the month. (laughs) I'm Marvin the Martian. (laughs) Anyway, this will probably all get cut out. I might leave it in just for (laughs) comedy. Uh, Yes, my throwback graphic of the month. I'm going to break from the kind of pattern that we've done. Right. The last few that we've done have been Eisner Award winning books. This isn't an Eisner Award winning book. But in my eyes it should be. Because I'm a dirty horror psycho whore. And I love this shit. Like, just rub it all over my chest when no one's about it. Like, ah. Cremate them with it, basically. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, it is Clive Barker's Hellraiser, and it's uh, from two the uh, 2011 run because there's been a couple little pieces and stuff that he's done. But this was uh, published by Boom Studios, uh, and it's written by Clive Barker and Christopher Monfit. Monfit, yeah, and the art by is uh, Leonardo Manco, and. All I'm going to say is, wow. When I picked this up in 2011, uh, it was something different. Like, I, I, At the time, I was only reading superhero stuff. And I was rarely venturing outside that box because, well, I didn't really know what to look for. And when I saw this crop up on Comixology at the time, I was like, I like the Hellraiser movies. I like the Hellbound Heart. I wonder if I could give this a try. And I was hooked for the first issue. This first volume is beautiful and fucking heart-wrenching at the same time. This is an official tie-in from the second Hellraiser movie, so everything after that is non-essential by this uh, comic. So if you're a fan of Hellraiser 1 and 2, because, you know, let's be honest, they are the good ones. Well, it's written by the man himself, Clive Barker. Yes, that's so. that's what I love. He's helmed this to a point of, like, I want to create a, a genuine, proper sequel. So, yeah. Uh, it's very strange. It's a very, very dark book. Uh, within the first couple of pages, we're showing the Lump Marchant's device. And we're already showing the title characters, like uh, Pinhead and the Cenobites. And it sounds like a band, doesn't it? A pinhead and the Xenopathies. <laughs> like it's nah, I, I, I'd, I'd go to see them. I, 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 I wouldn't have been in the pit for them because it sounds deadly as fuck. Aye, aye. I mean, I, I'd be standing at the back of the crowd, there, like, 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 soaking it in, you know? Up there with, like, Lordy. Like, that yeah. kind of band. And I would totally pay for that. Yeah. Someone create that shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, and... Well... As classic pinhead style, he just uh, rips this young lassie apart with a lot of chains with hooks because that's his that's his kink. That's what he said. Uh, yeah, I really I really like this book. I think this book is very it's very honourable to the previous works. You know, it's honourable to the previous films, but it goes the step further that the films couldn't. You know, and if you're a big fan of like horror literature, this is definitely an essential to me. Like, Just like the first couple of pages, uh, like I said, the last he's ripped apart, and then we're seeing some guy just like cleaning up the mess afterwards, and we're kind of left speculating, like, what is his tie into this, and why wasn't he ripped apart? And then we're showing hell in all its glory. 
and with the labyrinth for maze and everything. And Pinhead seems very. How can I put it? Chill, for what's just happened. He's he's almost. Well, he's fucking Pinhead. He's, of course, he's, he's chill. He's like he's, he's beyond the point at this stage. He's seen everything. He's done everything, and he's wanting something. You can tell it. He's is wanting something more from his life. Like, he's presided over many tortures and pleasures for people for years, decades. And right bang in the first first issue of this volume, he's having a... He's having a nice wee chit-chat with Leviathan. And he's wanting something more. He's... He's fed up. You can tell it's almost like the Joker. You know, he's 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 depressed. Very much. He like just uh, needs a hug in the face. Very much you know? like uh, Lucifer in the books. Just bored. Like he's he's had enough, and he wants something a bit more. He wants a more fulfilled life, and I think that makes Hellraiser Pinhead. Yes, rather relatable <laughs> in a weird way. Like. Yeah, because I torture people on a nightly basis. <laughs> well, you know, depends what your partner Well, well like Nicola it. tells me that I torture her all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Verbally, oh, yeah. <laughs> verbally. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Glasgow Region Geeks Kink section, where you can get all your 18 plus talk on everything. <laughs> but yeah, I think, I, I think oddly enough, it does make Pinhead slightly humanised on the level that he just wants something a bit more. Yeah. He's he's fed up. He's at the point where he actually says that he wants to be human, which is is kind of odd. You know, he he gave up his life as a human to basically experience all these pleasures and pains and take everything in, and through that became a priest in hell. And he's well. From from our eyes and watching the movies and stuff, Pinhead is a lead character. Every time that he is a lead character. So he has had enough and he's wanting almost redemption. He's wanting to return to flesh and grow old. He wants the challenge of being human. He wants the challenge of having that opportunity to go back and to see if he would prefer it. And obviously, like, when he does say this, you know, you've got Leviathan who says, He demands you stay. And the chat with Leviathan, he's obviously saying, oh, this is what I want. And he's like, I know the risks. And Leviathan's like, and the cost, a suitable replacement, a worthy servant. And, he'll re- and Pinhead says, I have a name. And then he says, he demands you speak it. Yeah, and what I love is the next page... We actually don't see what he said. We just see Leviathan. And, and honestly, is there a more demonic piece of art than that page right there? Absolutely Leviathan not. is saying, a fascinating choice. We are agreed. Go now and make it gospel. This like is, there's there's this the, is the whole Pinhead dark satanic. This is Pinhead at his finest. Like, look at that outfit he's wearing. Look at everything behind him. Well, this is the thing. Never have I seen a more he, beautifully illustrated version of hell. You you got it in a nutshell. This is basically everything that they couldn't do in the films. This is just... Complex they're, they're allowed story. to explore the characters. I know there's been other uh, Hellraiser titles before, but they've been more of... I've actually read a lot of them, if not all of them, and they are more anthology-style uh Comics like memoirs, we, memoirs. That's yeah, what they are. Like, pick, this pick, is my picking, life. picking different centibites and different humans, experiencing different uh, boxes, opening different boxes and stuff, and then then suffering. So nothing has really stayed true to the films. This is the first attempt, first proper attempt, and right from the get go, it's a big bloody mess. Oh, of course, of course. Uh, what we do have is this guy whose name is Samuel Hess. He's we we find out he's a servant to Hell uh, to Pinhead and Leviathan and the Dark. Well, I call him Dark Church. Yeah, we'll call him Dark Church. And he's burying this body in a field, which 
the the body that we saw getting absolutely flayed open with chains and stuff. And in the field is a crop. A crop, crop, a crop, a crop square, a, a crop square of the La Marchant device, which uh, then we're taking to an artist, an artist, an artist. Yes, and it takes a couple uh, pages to find out that it's actually Kirsty Cotton. If you're not familiar with the Hellraiser movies, it's a female lead character from those two movies, the daughter of Frank who gets his face like. Stuck on his brother and stuff, which is lovely. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. yes, uh, as you can see, she's getting jiggy with it. Rotchy sexy times, rotchy sexy times. Yeah. In terms of like the actual art style in these scenes, these sort of human scenes, I mean, there's, there's the painting of that of pinhead. pinhead you yeah. Know, there's an well, that's the thing. How could you not be traumatized with something like that? Absolutely. She's literally seen the gates of hell, walked through it kicked ass and ran back out. Yeah, for the lols, obviously, for the giggles and survival. Yes. So she's made this gorgeous, I must say, painting of Pinhead and in the background we see her getting proper jiggy with her man who's just proposed to her. So she's obviously still a bit cut up about everything that's happened in the films. And yeah, we see a bit of her life, I think. I think we just see a tiny bit of her life. So then we're going back, you know. Yeah, this uh, this volume introduces, well, reintroduces our main characters, Pinhead and Kirsty Cotton. But also, along with Kirsty Cotton, she has a few friends. And these friends are almost hunters of sort. They're hunting down Lamarchant devices and destroying them. They see this as a gateway to hell. So, what other way than to stop the Cenobites and all the suffering and pain that they've brought with them throughout the years than to destroy them and seal them up? Yeah. Ultimately, I think what happens with these books is that they genuinely, cohesively continue the story that we we already know. And it's nice, it's nice, it's, it's really, really... Like I said before, it's honourable. And this is the step further they probably would have went in the films, knowing Clive. Yeah. So, you know, it's very reminiscent of his style. It's very reminiscent of the films. And I think when you read these books, it is very, you know, your supernatural-esque. You get that feeling right away. And I like that. And I certainly think that go that step further and... You know, part of you sits there and thinks, well, if this book, if this volume was a film, you'd be like, oh my god, I'm so behind it. But they couldn't get away with half the stuff they've done in this book in the first no, issue. No, that's the thing. They, they allow you to explain more concepts throughout. Uh, with Kirsty Cotton and our gang, uh, in this volume, we are treated to how they came to be uh, in this group of them hunting down these Lamarchant devices, different ones, a music box, a little carousel music box, uh, to, th- to name one, and destroy them and the Cenobites that are brought with them. It's It shows that there's a resistance that this maybe broke Kirsty at such a young time, because if I remember right, she's supposed to be like a late teen, you know, late teen, early, maybe early 20s. So, this has scarred her and the people around her, obviously, her family's gone now. So, she's just went on a war path of justice and revenge to make sure that no one suffers from this. And in the second issue, uh, this absolute disturbing Cenobite, it's got like a brain and then there's a one that's like a spider come through, this is a music box carousel, a uh, marching device. And they, they end up killing the Cenobites, but before they even get done with them, the family that had this box is already gone. And her first words is, I'm sorry. She, she wanted to save everyone, but she's constantly coming up against the fight of 
these are demonic beings or super powered beings and this is only going to fuel her rage to make sure everything is closed off to the world and Leviathan and all the dark church whatever is sealed away in terms of the art the actual artwork of it I really enjoy it I enjoy the artwork it's very classic horror if it was done I mean like there's there's a specific page as well when someone's getting killed and there's just blood everywhere but the blood like is dripping on other panels and I just like that I like the use of the page you know not worrying about being so consistent to their panels like it actually feels oddly interactive yeah and I like that it's like it, it continues the whole this is all connected this is all one story so in terms of the actual artwork, I really, I, I can't fault it. It's a, it's a nice simplistic w- style. It's not overly really beautifully overly detailed done. artwork as well. Like very intimately detailed. Like you go from a kind of like simplistic facial expression, which is done very commonly, very like classic kind of comic book style, and then. You go right into the dark side of it, which is... Fucking Cave Carson has a cybernetic eye level. Yeah, like it's yeah. It's proper in-depth. You're seeing, like, metal. You're seeing the breaks in the metal. You're seeing... Li- Decaying flesh. You're seeing yeah, a nice reflection on the darkened surfaces and stuff. It's it. It's not just, like, one style. It's almost, like, done by two different artists in certain pages. points. Yeah, diff- diff- different points. So uh, yeah, I, abs- I absolutely can't fault the artwork in it. I think it's just so gripping itself. Very reminiscent of your sort of Japanese horror film. You know, like so detailed, so creepy. And even when you're reading it, part of you is like, oh, that's a wee bit risky. A wee bit risky. Think. Yeah, it's like, hmm, how did you get away with that? But again, comics, they can get away with near enough in. But uh, yeah, this comic uh it does have its down points it it doesn't flesh out the characters enough i feel the supporting cast you know, like i said you're already aware of kirsty cotton and pinhead you already know them from the movies but uh with this you're not you don't really get to see much of the supporting cast which is quite a shame because well it 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 does go at a very fast pace this first volume it basically goes zero to six in like one issue well i mean i've always said that you know first the first issue makes the impression and the first issue of this volume is fantastic i think it does what it should do it, it sets pinhead up as i don't want to do this anymore i want to leave and then he gives a name we don't know the name and he's as far as you're concerned he's gone he's like he's doing his own thing now but then, as you say, the rest of the book kind of doesn't always stick to that. It's very much like it goes between Pinhead deciding that he wants something different to Kirsty Cotton going, well, we have to destroy all these boxes, we need to do this. And it's like, I see why, but it's focusing on two completely different story arcs. Well, that's the thing. It's the good and the evil. Well, it is. But, but then again, they, they don't is, conflict, really. is Pinhead's uh, course of action really evil? He's wanting redemption. He's wanting to be a man again. So is it good and good? Or is it a tale of good and evil? Basically, yeah. And as the story progresses, I think it does gradually... I think it goes down and then it goes back up. I don't think there's too many consistent points of it going up, down, up, down, up, down. I think there's a point. I think it's sort of issue three into four. It's like doing a wee bit down and then it goes right back up. It just... there's. A slow burner. There's a slow period, I think. But overall, I, I really enjoy it. Is it the best thing I've ever read? No, but if you like Hellraiser, you'd love it. It's like the Hellraiser movies. They're not yeah. perfect. Yeah, uh, that isn't the greatest thing I've read, but it's one of the best horror tie-ins that I've read. Like, I've read some uh, Friday 13th stuff, and I'm trying to think of others. A couple other horror-style comics. But this is possibly my favourite of all because it is it does give homage to the original movies, the first two, because after that even I will agree with like they they went a little bit weird. 
Well, not that they were weren't weird in the first place, but that's just me. But uh, yeah, I would have to go. Artwork is very gory. It's very gory. It's got to be gory. It's Hellraiser. That's what we're expecting. That's what we get. Uh, story. Yeah, story is a kind of natural. Uh, it's a natural follow on. Ah, it's, so it's, it's pretty basic, really. And, well, I'm probably going to rate it a little bit higher because I'm biased towards Hellraiser and stuff anyway. But I would definitely say, mm, in my honest opinion, 8 out of 10. I think I'll get a 7. I think the artwork saves it, if anything. But, again, I'm very unbiased to the point where I'm just looking at it for what it is. And, you yeah. know, I love Hellraiser myself. I just think that deep down... This is a book that is an honest sequel because it's done by the people that made it, the people who built that identity, built that character. And it does continue on. And I think maybe that might slightly be its fault a bit mm. because it has to commit to what happened next. And that is a great thing because we get to see a bit more. But you're going between these two conflicting stories. You see Pinhead kind of doing his stuff. And I think the book's at its best when you see Pinhead, really. In my opinion. Yeah. So, I get a seven. I think it's... I, I still rate seven as pretty average, but above average. Yeah, it's it's yeah. pretty up there. Not going to change your life, this book. No. But if you like uh, Hellraiser... I've read uh, the entire series. It's something like 21, 22 issues with a couple follow-on series. And if I remember correctly, it gets a little bit weird and over the top towards the end, but... It's it's tying off something. It's tying off Hellraiser, f- giving it a definitive end. So with that, yeah, the first volume is good in itself, but if you are a real horror fan, you need to read this series. It is yeah, absolutely. It's maybe not what I would think the end result would be for Hellraiser, uh, the, s- the story of Hellraiser. But I like it. I don't hate it. I like it, I don't hate it. It's very much when you take something that was a film or something, even a comic book, and you change the medium. There is going to be problems, you know. There's problems with, like, Marvel and DC films. There's problems with everything in that, because originally they weren't made that way. So to change the medium, you have to change something. Something has to give. Yes. And that's probably where this book kind of has its fault. However, they had many, many, many moons after the film, to figure out where they were going with it. And God bless Clive for sticking to what he wanted and giving that wee yeah, extension that to the story, shall we call it. like, hurrah. Aye. Because, I mean, Pinhead, if you, if you talk about Hellraiser, Hellraiser is one thing that I've never really seen a remake of. Mm, there's, I remember a couple of years ago there was a word of a remake, but it never happened. It he's, it he's could it possibly he happen? Hellraiser yeah. is very much a saved identity, and I think it's because Clive Barker is really precious of it, and maybe that's for the best. And like I said, this book, if it's a horror essential, I think. Yes. Definitely, and I would definitely give it that in its title. It's a book by a well-renowned master of horror, and there are points of it where you can get a wee bit, ooh, ooh, that, that looked bad, that looked sore. And it takes you right back to Hellraiser, I think. And I have a lot of respect for it. So, aye. Cool, cool. Unfortunately, that is all we have this time. But if you want to listen to our other stuff, just have a wee search for us on SoundCloud and iTunes at Glaswegian Geeks. You know, we've got all our stuff there. We've got, uh, what have we got, James? Speak with me, talk with me. Well, <laughs> we've got other comics of the month. We've got, got other uh, comics la- of the our month. last ish- our last episode. Never rub another. <laughs> <laughs> Never rub I, I, I can't. I can't say it because it's too funny. Never rub mm. another man's rhubarb. Yes. <laughs> if you like it in the voice, it's Never rub another man's rhubarb. Yes, we've got that. We've got on you go, the alien one. Uh, I, I don't think I can steal your <laughs> thunder here. 
blow into the little hole and I will do the thing with him. Yes, <laughs> which is the Alien Covenant review. We, we do film reviews, we do game reviews. You usually find the game reviews on YouTube. Yes. You know, you have you have comics of the month. If you want to see us talk about something else, give us something to talk about and we'll make it happen. Yeah, give us some recommendations. You can listen to us on SoundCloud and iTunes and our podcast do get uploaded on YouTube as well if you prefer that. You know, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter. That's us. That's us at Glaswegian Geeks. Yes. And, yeah, Glaswegian Geeks. Yeah. And, and, and make sure you stay, uh, keep a lookout on Twitter. Uh, last couple of weeks we've had a wee poll running few each polls. week. And uh, actually turned out pretty well. They've selected a couple of horror stuff that we're uh, aiming to watch. Vote. Retweet, give us some recommendations to stick Let in a us know future what you poll. Think, you know. And last but not least, a big thank you and shout out to Brody's Kitchen, who mentioned us in their recent podcast. Get along, give them a listen to. They and another shout out to Comic Pals. Yes, 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 the Comic Pals. Uh, you can catch them on SoundCloud, iTunes, and YouTube. Not like they're your comic pals. We well, well, we n- we no one by like association of a former. Oh my god! From a former. Uh, Imagine a giant group crossover, the Glaswegian geeks with the comic with the comic pals what, what, and what, Brody's what Kitchen. We, what, we, what, we, what we call that? The Glaswegian comic pals. The Glaswegian comic pals in Brody's Kitchen. The big. Kitchen. Don't go there. Bro- Don't Bro- go there. Brody's Glaswegian comic pals. Wait, did I just spell that out there? I just spelled that out there, didn't I? And what did I just spell out there? If I opened the gates to hell, if I opened all the marching device, what's that in the corner, James? Is that Pinhead walking through that door right now? Yes, it is. I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, remember, rate, review and subscribe. Listen to our shit. Let us know what you think of our shit. And geek out! Is that too much? You should be dead. <laughs> Okay, I'll do it in a sexy way. Everybody, geek out. In my mouth. Well, that's so fucking suggestive, ain't it? Geek out in my mouth. Why isn't that our sign-off? Oh, well, that would be your sign-off, because you're the one that gets it in the mouth. (laughs) 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 Goodbye, everyone. (laughs)